rates of taxes. The government is under uh, a budget constraint. If the um, if the taxes fall short of the uh, services paid for, governments can typically borrow in return for uh, uh, promising to pay back later. Now, what Prescott and I did in that paper was we we thought of a simplified framework. Uh, you can think of it as a stylized framework. You can think of it as imagining that the government can formulate kind of a welfare function, a function that um, that it wants to maximize, uh, or I call it here an objective function. In in uh, in uh, in the description of household, we we describe preferences in the form of a utility function, and this utility function covers today and and far into the future. Similarly, we could imagine the government, um, the government's objective being such a function, representing the representative of the of the uh, people of the nation. Uh, and uh, I'm going to assume that this function is unchanging, regardless of what uh, what government is in power. Let's imagine that we abstract from the fact that different governments might want to change the objective. Really. And then you can simply think of that as an additional complication on top of what I'm about to tell you. So imagine the uh, objective function of the, uh, of the government is unchanging. The government is subject to budget constraints, just like you and me. Here's the theoretical result we discovered. And that is that optimal policy, the policy resulting from the government calculating what the outcome should be, uh, the outcome maximizing that objective function over time, that optimal policy generally is inconsistent over time. And uh, it implies or it requires a commitment mechanism in order for it to be implemented. If no such commitment mechanism exists, uh, suppose the, uh, uh, the government succumbs to the consistency, then as we showed through some uh, graphic examples, one in the context of monetary policy, one in the context of fiscal policy, the outcomes can be very bad. Uh, what's the fundamental reason? Well, the, this optimal policy calculated by the government, if it does it right, it will take into account the effect this policy has on the behavior of the millions of people and the thousands of businesses are into the future. Uh, there are many, many such decisions by the by the government that play a role for for uh, people's visit decisions or businesses' decisions. An obvious example is investment behavior. You build a factory. You uh, spend millions of dollars today, and uh, the, the revenue comes in the form of, while well, you sell the, re the resulting goods you produce, you sell them over maybe the next 10, 20, 30 years, for as long as this so-called capital stock uh, um, is, uh, is uh, productive. So this revenue, is uncertain. Not only do you have to think about how productive the economy is going to be far into the future, but there's the additional source of uncertainty, and that is because what matters to you is, as an investor, it is how much revenue or income do I get after the government has taken its share. That's really what matters. So then you have to think about what is that share, what is that tax rate that the, the government will apply to my income, to my revenue. So, so that's an example, but there are lots and lots of, of such an, an exam, of such examples, including uh, also uh, if you think rationally about uh, the decision to, to um, accumulate more or less education, more or less human capital, the same kind of considerations can come into play. So, you take that into account, um, 
and in that optimal plan. Now let, let's fast forward, say five years. Of course, this, uh, the economy has been chugging along, investments have been made, etc. The government sits down and they decide to recalculate this policy. Now, remember the policy is already in effect, it's in effect for maybe another five, 10, 20 years. If it is recalculated, you'll find that you'll find a completely different policy. You may find that while at time zero, I had promised a tax rate on capital income of 10%, now it seems optimal to say, oh, we might want to tax the next year, so the following year, or the following couple of years, capital income uh, at the rate of 50%, the thinking being that these factories will not be closed down, they will still, uh, they, most of them will still continue to operate. It seems like a cheap way for the government to generate its revenue. Um, now, to counteract the effect that uh, future investors will, will worry about these higher taxes. They might say, uh, oh yes, and we'll reduce the taxes again uh, back to the old level uh, in uh, two or three years. Uh, the end outcome is likely to be the higher tax rates than, uh, than are optimal for the society. Uh, in the case of monetary policy, what we showed in our example was the economy is likely to end up in a higher inflation rates than is, is in the interest of society. So, so I already talked about the examples where the temptation is the greatest. The temptation could be to increase the tax on physical and human capital. It, it could be to uh, partially renege on government debt through surprise inflation. That's something that's happened often in Latin America. Debt was issued at a nominal interest rate, maybe in local currency, and then a hyperinflation hits, and the debt becomes essentially worthless to the holder of the debt. Meantime, from the point of view of the government, it, it's essentially costless to pay it back. It's costless in real terms. Um, so all of this suggests that there is, there is uh, an incentive that from the point of view of society, it'd be nice if we had a mechanism to tie the government's hands so that this uncertainty about the future resulting from or coming from government behavior, that it's, it's removed. In the case of monetary policy, these are three examples uh, such mechanisms that have been tried uh, at various times. The gold standard dates back to mostly to the 19th century, and it lasted for a long time, but fell apart in the uh, finally by 1930. Uh, the currency board is an interesting example because it was tried in Argentina, the example I like to use in my talk. Argentina, as you'll see uh, graphically, fell on very hard times in the 1980s. Uh, so badly that that decade is often called the lost decade. There were hyperinflations. Um, uh, someone told me, I have forgotten these numbers, but someone told me yesterday the, uh, the inflation rate got up to 3,000% annually in 1989. Just an astounding number. That, that's not the world record. Bolivia had even higher inflation rates in the 80s. Um, so when Carlos Menem took over in, uh, in about 1990, he figured he had to do something to uh, increase the credibility of Argentina. And, and that's when he came upon the idea of a currency board to accumulate dollar reserves, promise that you will tie, that will, you will be willing to exchange the peso one for one with a dollar. That worked for a while, for about eight years, and then it fell apart. Uh, and uh, my, my quick take on why it fell apart, 
key reason was that well, monetary policy cannot be used in completely in isolation from fiscal policy, especially not in this case. Uh, and in the case of Argentina, what they did not uh, solve was the fiscal situation. In Argentina, the provinces can borrow. Uh, they're not subject to a Alice budget requirement like the, uh, the states, most of the states of the United States. They, they can borrow, and uh, in the, towards the end of the 1990s, it became clear that they would not be able to pay back their loans. They came running to the federal government to bail them out, and then the federal debt ballooned, ballooned dramatically. Uh, and for whatever reasons, uh, the government decided they could not hold the line, and then, uh, and then they, uh, the, the peso is now, well, it takes about three pesos to buy one dollar. Um, now, the, uh, the, uh, the mechanism that's more prevalent today is the idea of an independent central bank to try to isolate monetary policy as much as possible from political pressure by having a uh, competent uh, organization conduct monetary policy and uh, not try not to succumb to the pressure that would always fall on the central bank from, from politicians. And, and this has been used to various degrees in, in countries. Someone calculated an index of independent, independence across nations on a scale from one to five, and the uh, correlation between the uh, independence degree of independence and the inflation environment being benign, it's, it's very high. Uh, it's, uh, in, uh, countries have changed, in fact, over the past 10 or 20 years. Bank of England is an example where uh, monetary policy was under the central government. The Bank of England was made independent in 1997. Scandinavian countries have become more independent Argentina is an example where the central bank is absolutely not independent. Uh, there have been times when the head of the central bank, years, when the head of the central bank was replaced half a dozen times in one year. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, and it shows in the, in the inflation uh, experience of Argentina. So what many Many central banks, especially those that are fairly independent in these days, they try to make their policy transparent. They make clear what their inflation target is, and they try to follow that target. Um, that has worked pretty well, although uh, one might say that they haven't really been put to the test because the digital cycle environment has been quite benign in since the uh, early to mid 90s. Uh, we seem to be going into a rougher period now and we'll see uh, it, see how well this works when they're really put to the test. This, um, this last point is a little subtle and so in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll skip it and, uh, and instead invite you to come and talk to me about this uh, afterwards. Um, so let me talk about the main forces uh, for economic growth. Inflation, I don't, the inflation environment